church. It is great to be with you. My name is Ethan Magnus, one of the pastors here, and I am so glad to be sharing with you today's message as we continue our series, This Changes Everything. I wish I could be there with you in person for two reasons. One, I just like preaching live better than on video, but mainly because this weekend I am off at the west end of the state dropping my oldest son off at governor's school, and he's going to be gone for a whole month this summer. Uh, They say that governor's school is to help students prepare for college. That is not true. I'm convinced it's to help parents prepare for the emotional turmoil of sending their kids to college. So you can be praying for me. My kid's going to be gone for a whole month this summer. But I'm thrilled uh, to be able to use video to share this week's message because I'm so excited about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Hey, before I jump into though, some things going on this summer you don't want to miss. Don't forget VBS registration like closes really soon because VBS is right around the corner. Also, next week is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day we remember the birthday of the church. And as we've done in past years, as part of our offering next week, we'll give a birthday present to a brand new church that is launching. uh, And you'll hear all about that next week. Last week, of course, Dr. Lawson brought our message on This Changes Everything as we work our way through the book of Acts. I loved his message. I had a great weekend last weekend. Uh, He was up here preaching, so I sort of like I got a Memorial Day weekend off. On Sunday, in fact, I was able to sleep in with my family, go to brunch, go for a hike, and then come to the Sunday night service. And I will just say it was amazing. I love the energy of our Sunday night service. And so maybe if you this summer have a weekend where your schedule is disrupted a little bit, Don't forget about our Sunday night service at 5 p.m. You'd be welcome there. It's a great community, and just the atmosphere is just fantastic. All right, we're working our way through the book of Acts, looking at how the resurrection of Jesus Christ has changed everything. And from this week's reading, we had a lot of amazing texts we could have looked at, but I want to focus on Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Uh, You can read about it in detail in in Acts chapter 19. The whole chapter is about his time in Ephesus. I want to look at just a few parts of that ministry. Uh, If you've got a Bible with you, open it up to Acts chapter 19, or maybe you can use your phone. Also, the words will be up on the screen. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. He first meets some Christians who are already Christians and begins to teach them. And then in verse 8, his public ministry begins. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way, so Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. While he can preach in the synagogue, he preaches in the synagogue. When they kick him out, he finds a a public space right in downtown Ephesus where he can continue his public ministry. Verse 10, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the whole province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. You can read and see the miraculous conversions that Paul experienced. Verse 18 says, Many of those who believed now came and confessed their sin. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, after all this happened, uh, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he stayed just a little longer in the province of Asia. It was in that little longer uh, that he had a little bit of an incident. Verse 23, about that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. 
a silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and he said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray a large number of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that the gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is a danger that not only our trade will lose its good name, but that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and that the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious, and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Uh, You can read on in the text, there was a little bit of a riot, and finally the city clerk shows up and has to calm everybody down. Remind people that they have done nothing wrong. They haven't attacked the temple. They haven't robbed the treasuries. They haven't even blasphemed or said anything bad directly about Artemis. He calms people down and the crowds disperse. But I want you to notice something about Paul's ministry in Ephesus. It starts the way you would expect. Uh, He preaches in the synagogue. Uh, Some of the Jews convert to faith in Christ. He he begins to preach the Gentiles. Many of them have faith in Christ. The church grows. They plant other churches throughout the province. Everything seems normal up until that point until you recognize that Paul hasn't just made a few converts. He hasn't just planted a little church. Paul has so transformed the whole region that Demetrius, the silversmith, is scared. You see, Demetrius depended on an economy of evil. He depended on people being afraid of Artemis and feeling like they had to appease Artemis by buying these little statues and worshiping these little idols. And this very economy of evil is being undermined by the growth of the ministry of God's church. They weren't just huddled up in a corner. They were actually transforming the very community where they were. And I think there's something in this story for us to learn. Because that is how you measure the impact of a local church. Not just how many programs they have. Not just how many people they have. But how is the presence of that local church transforming its community? Where are the economies of evil that are being undermined by the declaration of the gospel, by the conversion of souls? I don't want to steal too much from my sermon on July 7th, but that week we'll look at Jeremiah's advice in Jeremiah 29. Advice he gave to God's people who were living in a foreign land. He says a lot of stuff in that chapter, but in verse 7 of chapter 29, here's what he says. Seek the peace and prosperity. Of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. This is still a part of our mandate as God's people. Preach Jesus Christ, absolutely. Call people to salvation in his name, of course. And while we do that, Be a people of blessing to wherever God's put us. Seek the peace and prosperity of the land where God has placed us. And this is exactly what Paul did in Ephesus. He didn't just plant a little church off in the corner. He went into the public spaces, called people to the lordship of Christ, and made the city a better place to live. Now, Demetrius didn't see that way. He didn't make it a better place for Demetrius. But Demetrius was giving, getting rich on the fear and idolatry of the people of the province of Asia. And Paul set them free from that fear. Free from their compulsion to worship false gods. Free from their compulsion to seek a favor with a goddess who didn't even exist by buying these little statues. And what I want us to consider today is this truth. That God's people and God's church still has the opportunity to not just be a place where blessing happens, but to be agents of blessing to our place. You see, the resurrection changes everything. 
It even changes the scorecard for the church. It makes us count different and count better. To not just count tithes in the offering, but to count the transformation of our city. To not just count the people in the church, but to count people and to keep to, to bless people and to count people who are being the church out in their workplaces, out in their schools, out in their apartments, in their neighborhoods, in their cul-de-sacs, and their city. I was working one time with a, a marriage ministry group um, that and we were studying Acts chapter 19 and looking at Paul's ministry in Ephesus. And, and they got to asking the question, what would it look like if their marriage ministry had the same kind of impact in their county that Paul did in the province of Asia, where just his proclamation of the gospel undermined the sale of Artemis statues? And they came to this decision. They decided that from here on out, they weren't just going to count how many people came to their marriage retreats and how many key people, how many couples participated in their marriage mentoring program. They were going to start counting how many divorces happened in their county. And they said, our goal as a ministry is to start bringing that number down. That's amazing. That's a group of people who've realized their opportunity they have to be agents of blessing to the place where God has put them. I remember they said, it may be crazy to think that our little marriage ministry could change the divorce rate of our whole big county. But look at what Paul did to Ephesus. The silversmiths started a riot because so many people heard about Jesus Christ. They changed the scorecard for their ministry. It reminds me of the first time I played putt-putt when I was old enough to keep score. I was playing with my older cousins. We were halfway through the round of putt-putt golf, and I was so impressed with myself. I got a copy of the scorecard, and I was winning. And not just by a little bit. I was crushing. I had twice as many points as my oldest cousin, Alex, did. Until a few holes later, my big brother explained to me that I had misunderstood the scorecard for that game. And I was not winning. I was losing by a lot. And that same thing can happen to the church. We can think the scorecard is about how many programs or how many people. Instead of remembering that the scorecard God gave us is to make disciples, to reach the lost, and to be a blessing to the place where God has sent us. So maybe that's a question we want to ask as a church. How can we bless our world? How can we transform our communities like the church in Ephesus transformed their whole region? Well, it would start with this question. How has God blessed us? That's the first thing we got to know. What has God given to us? What, what money, what time, what talents, what gifts has God given to us that we could share? That'd be the first thing. The second thing would be, what does our world need? Number one, what do we have? How has God blessed us? Number two, what does our place need? What's needed in the place where God has put us? It's amazing to me how easy it is for me to stop noticing what my world needs. I just get so focused on what I need, I forget to notice what other people need. But what if we did? if we made a determination to notice the needs of our community, if we asked a local school teacher or a local police officer or a local social worker, what does our community need and how does that connect with how God has blessed us? The third thing, if we really wanted to be a church committed to blessing our world like God has called us to, we'd have to know how has God blessed us, what are the needs of our place where God has put us, and the third thing is we'd have to remember the heart of God. And it turns out it is easy to forget the heart of God. I know it shouldn't be, but God's people throughout the Bible, we see God's people keep forgetting what matters to God's heart. Uh, God's people have always forgotten, and we are no exception. I forget the heart of God. And probably so do you. We start to think that what is important to us is automatically important to God. And we forget that it's supposed to be the other way around. That what's important to God, 
becomes important to us. I think of Isaiah 58. Isaiah was a prophet sent by God because God's people had forgotten what mattered to God. They were really good at the worship stuff and really good at the religious stuff, but they had forgotten God's heart. Isaiah chapter 58, you can grab your Bibles or follow along on the screen. Here's what Isaiah came to say. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions. They, they seem eager for God to come near to them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Here's the answer. Yet... On the day of your fasting, you do as you please, and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife, in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen, only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Isn't this the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry, to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked, to clothe them and to not turn away your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear and your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness. Your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs even in a sun-scorched land. He will strengthen your frame. You'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose water never fails. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up the age-old foundations. You'll be called the repairer of broken walls, the restorer of streets with dwellings. God sends a prophet, Isaiah, to remind people that even if we get all the religious stuff right, if we forsake the heart of God for God's people, and the place where he's put us. Well, then the religious stuff doesn't matter. Notice God's heart for the oppressed and the stranger and the homeless and the widow and the poor and the orphan for broken homes and broken streets and oppressed people. And God says, if you are my people, if you are saved by my grace, by the free gift of my son, I want my heart to become your heart. I want you to care about what I care about. And, and I love this at the end. He says, and if you were to do that, if you were to care about what I care about, let my heart become your heart, well, doggone it, we'd have to give you a nickname, wouldn't we? We'd call you the repairer of the broken walls. And we'd call you the rebuilders of streets with dwellings. I love that. I love the notion that we could so dedicate ourselves to the heart of God, to a life of blessing for our city, that God would give us a nickname. And that is God's call to action for every church that bears God's name. And it's God's call for this church. God says, I want you to be such a blessing to your world that they have to give you a nickname. That everybody, when they talk about you, has to talk about how you are blessing my people and my beloved for my glory. This is what Paul did in Ephesus. 
He didn't just plant a church. He, he so exercised the gospel of Jesus Christ that the very economy of evil was undone in that place. And when our gifts are leveraged in the place God has put us for the purposes of God's heart, that's exactly what can happen through us as well. And I need you to know, this very thing is already happening through First Christian Church. God is already using the gifts of this church leveraged in our place to accomplish the heart of God for God's beloved creation. Uh, let me just give you one example. Here's a little update on a ministry called Safe Families. Uh, we've been talking about this for two or maybe three, getting close to three years now around here. Uh, the, the mission of Safe Families is really simple. Safe Families provides short-term housing for children so that families can get the help they need to make a permanent difference in the trajectory of their lives. And, and the truth of the matter is, there are dozens of families in our county that, that, that short-term housing is the only thing they need to get their family to change the trajectory of their family from destruction to hope. I, this year already, in 2019, our church has hosted 14 different times. We had 14 different hosting. Uh, many for as short as a few days, but every one pivotal in the lives of a child and the lives of a family. I asked our regional director, who's a member here at First Christian, I said, just give me some idea of what kind of difference we're making. What would these, because it seems so small. How could three days of babysitting really make that big a difference? And, and so she gave me some examples of the way we're making a difference. Uh, here are just five of those 14 families. A military couple with two children moved to the area. Uh, mom was pregnant with her third, and they didn't know anybody in town. Mom went into early labor, and it was a little bit complicated, and she needed her husband with her, but none of their family from out of town was able to come in to care for her children. So they didn't know what to do. So somebody reached out to save families, and one of you all took care of her kids so her husband could be with her for a very complicated delivery. Here's another. A single mom fled across the country, to escape domestic violence with her two-year-old son, and she was pregnant. She got released from the hospital. The baby was healthy, but she had to go back into the hospital because of some stuff related to the birth. What was she going to do? She knew no one. She was hiding from her abuser. Well, one of you, through safe families, took in her two children so she could recover in the hospital and know that her children were safe. Uh, DCS, Department of Child Services, gave us a call about another mom. She needed child care for two weeks because she was homeless and without a job. She had an opportunity to get housing and trained for a job, but it took two weeks to do it. And she couldn't do that while caring for her child. If she didn't have housing in two weeks, DCS was going to come in and take her child. I want you to notice, this is what it's like to be trapped by poverty. If she could just get two weeks of free child care, at the end of that two weeks, she would have a job and a place to live. She'd get to keep her child, and she was on a trajectory for success. Without two weeks of free child care, she couldn't get the job and couldn't get the place to live, and she would lose her child. So, say family stepped in. We found a place for the mom to live. And the child to live, she got the job training, she got the job, her family was saved, and she's making it because we stepped in for just two weeks. Here's another one, not quite so happy, but just as essential. A mother overdosed and died, leaving an 11-month-old baby with no one to care for them. DCS was able to track down an aunt who lived many, many states away and couldn't get in town for a while. They wanted to keep the baby from getting into the system because this aunt was ready to care for the baby, but somebody had to step in until the aunt could get here. And so one of you did and took care of that baby for three, three days while the aunt traveled across the country. Last one. Here's another one of these where because one of you stepped in, just the whole trajectory of a family got changed. A mom and dad are struggling with addiction. They're about to lose their children. They have an opportunity 
to go to a detox plan and some, get some rehab to get clean and restore their family. But they can't do that unless somebody takes care of the kids and unless somebody has a place for them to stay because they can't work or care for their kids while they're in rehab. So they have a choice. Abandon their kid and go to rehab or take care of their kid and then stay in their addiction and have their kid get taken away because they don't know a single person who will take care of their child for them. So DCS calls Safe Families. And one of you took care of their children for a month so this couple could get clean, get jobs, get a place to live, and their family was saved. That's five of 14 families that have been rescued this year because of our church. I'm telling you, doggone it, we keep this up, Somebody's going to have to give this church a nickname because that's what God does when God's people recognize that they've been gifted to be a blessing to the place where God has planted them. This is amazing. And it's for those of you who are doing it, I just want to say thank you. I wish I could tell every, all 14 of these stories. And I hope that you with me are celebrating every time we got to say yes to a family this year. But I do want to tell you one more number. At the end of our email correspondence, she was telling me about these 14 families. I asked one last question. I said, okay, so you've gotten to say yes 14 times this year. How many times have you had to say no? How many times has there been a family that needed our help, but you couldn't find a host for their children to help rescue this family? 14 yeses. 50 times. We've had to say no. Listen, I, I'm so excited about the way God is using this church to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the, the goodness of God for our world, to stop the economy of evil. But there is so much more to be done. I, I want to be real specific with safe families. We think this ministry needs to grow. It's having such a huge impact in the families we can help. If you're able to help, either by being a short-term host or by donating diapers or cribs, on the connection card this week, that's the, on the bottom of the bulletin that you got in as you walked out, I'm holding up like I have one. I don't have one, but if I did, it'd be right here. If Grab your bulletin. On the bottom, you'll see a connection card. Fill that out, and there's a checkbox. It just says, I want more information. You're not making any commitment with that. We're just going to give your information to, to, our, to a church member who's a part of Safe Families. They'll contact you with more information about how you can help. If you've got questions today about how you could become a host family, we've got a booth set up in the atrium. Stop by and talk to them. We want to increase our capacity to save lives through safe families because this is the scorecard God has given God's people. Not just how many you baptize, not just how many people fit in your pews, not just how many programs, although all of those things are essential parts of God's mission, but also how are we able to bless the place where God has put us so that they might see and recognize the goodness and glory of God in the work God sends us to do? I could tell you so much more. It's, it's bigger than safe families, of course. We're active in food drives and a veteran's lemonade stand and oil change and handyman ministry. We've got this huge new thing coming we're going to tell you about in a couple weeks called Love JC. It's going to be a citywide initiative. We're partnering with a whole bunch of churches. It's going to be awesome. But all of these are just ways for us to fulfill our mandate because I want to see happen in our region what happened in Ephesus. I want the economy of evil to take notice and be like, if that just church folks keep converting people like they're converting them and blessing people like they're blessing them and caring people like they're caring for them, well, our whole system's going to break down. I want that. I want the systems of evil to break down because the people of God are too busy doing the work of good in our community. This is the scorecard for the church. Do we count the people that show up? Yep. Do we count our programs? Yep. Do we diligently pursue proclaiming the glory of God so that people might turn and give their life to Christ? Absolutely. And on top of that, we go out and we be the church out in the world that desperately needs to know the love and compassion of our God. We count every person who comes. 
But we also start to expect that through us, God would send us out to transform our city by the power of God's grace. Let's pray. Truly, God, your resurrection has changed everything. And because of what you have done on the cross, we can now be forgiven. And we can carry that grace with us out into your world. I thank you specifically, God, for the ministry of safe families and the 14 families we've been able to rescue just this year. But God, we don't want to say no as often as we are right now. Would you please help more people to step up to be a host family for that ministry? God, I thank you for all the other ways, ways that we'll never get to mention from stage, that your people here gathered are also scattered, being a blessing in their workplaces and schools and apartment buildings and cul-de-sacs. Would you please, God, empower us to be agents of your blessing so that our city might be transformed by the gospel? Mostly, God, we thank you for the resurrection, which proves to us that our sin is not the end of the story, that death is not the end of the story, but that by your grace you have forgiven our sin. And by your resurrection, you have conquered death itself so that we might live to see this broken earth restored for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.